If you are just joining us this morning, welcome to Dartmouth College and to the Hood Museum of Arts Conference, Teaching Museums in the 21st Century, Moving Our Practice Forward. We hope that today continues to spark creative thoughts about the future of our museums, particularly regarding the unique mission of academic museums and our engagement with college and university students. I'm Juliette Bianco, Assistant Director of the Hood Museum of Art and moderator of today's first session, Toward the Ideal Learning Environment. I am honored to share the stage with visionary thinkers and innovators and look forward to learning together with you over the next few hours. I am also particularly thrilled that one of our panelists is a current Dartmouth College undergraduate student. I begin my opening remarks with the Hood Museum of Art's mission statement, adapted in 2012. The Hood Museum of Art is a teaching museum. Our mission is to create an ideal learning environment that fosters creative encounters with original works of art. When I was challenged to craft a session for this conference, I decided to begin with a question based on fulfilling this mission for which I have no ready answer, but for which I think there are many exciting possibilities. What is the ideal museum learning environment and how do we create one? Toward this end, I was further inspired by Mary Flanagan, the Sherman Fairchild Distinguished Professor in Digital Humanities at Dartmouth, who said this about envisioning the college classroom of the future, quote, it is hard to innovate in one discipline without an outside perspective, end quote. To this answer then, I tasked myself with bringing together leading higher education innovators from outside the museum field so that we may be best informed with regard to the ideal learning environment within the field as we begin to envision it. Today's four panelists and respondent are here to help us do so while addressing further issues as well, such as who benefits from this learning environment and what are their interests and values? <coughs> what does an ideal learning environment look like? And how could technology support new ways to think and learn about art objects? A study conducted by the staff at the Allen Memorial Art Museum at Oberlin College revealed that, in general, students' basic analytical skills increase after they engage with works of art in the museum's collection. Although this study represented a small sampling of students, the findings are not surprising. I'm sure we have all witnessed the value of object-based learning in many ways at our own institutions. But especially for those of us in the process of designing new museum spaces and or looking to change or enhance our practice, we must know more about this value and how to enhance it. What might a museum classroom look like where knowledge is created and not just shared? What does a museum classroom designed as a participatory learning space look like? How might students build arguments with objects? And what is the potential value of those arguments to disciplines outside our own? In a recent talk at Dartmouth College, Jeffrey Seligo, editor at large of the Chronicle of Higher Education said, quote, we overestimate the speed of change, but underestimate its reach, end quote. I hope this morning we begin to confront that reach, especially in relation to our practice at campus-based museums. I think that we must grasp the great potential in how museums might act as a point of intersection between the societies and cultures represented by the objects in our care and the concerns of students who study those objects through increasingly diverse lenses. I hope that the ideas these panelists share with us will frame a discussion about the opportunities for teaching museums in a new pedagogical environment, one that is collaborative, experimental, authentic, and experiential. As stewards of unique objects, we have the opportunity to forge dynamic relationships with the people, cultures, and technologies that are slowly, but surely shifting the ways we interpret, operate within, and contribute to a changing world. As we listen to this morning's speakers, we should think about how we might innovate in step with today's most forward-thinking te teaching and learning methods and tools so that our campus-based museums might continue to impact the curricular practice 
and encompass the globally minded and broadly multidisciplinary interests of today's and tomorrow's students. Each panelist here has already helped me to think in new ways about how we approach our museum practice, and so I'm delighted to introduce them to you now. Anya Donovan is Research Associate Professor and Director of the Ethics Institute at Dartmouth College, a consortium of faculty concerned with teaching and research in applied and professional ethics. Her research and publications are in the areas of moral ethics, applied and professional ethics, business ethics, and bioethics. Anya is author and co-author of many books, including most recently, Global Bioethics, Issues of Conscience for the 21st Century. She is the primary point of contact for integrating ethics into the curriculum, and she retains faculty appointments at Dartmouth Medical School and the Tuck School of Business. Following 35 years on the faculty of Columbia University in New York, more than half that time as chair of the Department of Astronomy and Astrophysics, David Helfand developed a deep understanding of the problems of traditional universities. Seizing an opportunity to redesign higher education from scratch, he has served as a founding tutor and since 2008 as president and vice chancellor of Quest University Canada. He is also president of the American Astronomical Society, the Professional Society for Astronomers, Astrophysicists, Planetary Scientists, and Solar Physicists in North America. Kenji Prepipatmonkol is a senior at Dartmouth College, majoring in comparative literature. He is currently finishing an honors thesis on the politics of utopian thought in Thai art and cinema following the 1997 Asian economic crash. Kenji is a research associate at the Thai Art Archives and has held curatorial internships at the Hood Museum of Art and the Museum of Art, Houston. He plans on researching transnational artistic networks in Southeast Asia when he begins his doctoral studies in the art history department at the University of Michigan this fall. Matthew Battles has written about technology's role in art, science, and cultural memory for such publications as The American Scholar, The Atlantic, The Boston Globe, Harper's Magazine, and Wilson Quarterly. Matthew has published extensively on the history and changing roles of archives, libraries, and museums. As a senior researcher with Meta Lab at Harvard, Matthew continues his engagement with the critical and curatorial dimensions of technology and art and culture through teaching, designing projects that blend the digital and the material, and forging partnerships among technologists, curators, and scholars. William Crow, our respondent for this morning, is Managing Museum Educator of School and Teacher Programs at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. He is also Assistant Professor of Museum Studies at NYU, where he's also a faculty fellow in residence responsible for informal learning programs for 970 NYU sophomores living at Gramercy Green Residence Hall. He has co-authored two publications for AAM, Unbound by Place or Time, Museums and Online Learning, and All Together Now, Museums and Online Collaborative Learning. He is currently a PhD candidate in Cognitive Studies at Teachers College, Columbia University. Please join me in welcoming our panelists. Great. Well, thanks, Juliet, and thanks. Um, boy, this is a big group. I, when I agreed to do this, I didn't know how many people were coming. It's really an impressive group. I'm Anya Donovan. As Juliet said, I, I direct the Ethics Institute. I've been at Dartmouth for um, almost 12 years now, and um, I came with the charge to direct the Ethics Institute, um, enhance ethics education at Dartmouth from the Naval Academy. So big switch. How many people have taken an ethics class? Not many at all. <laughs> Not many at all. Maybe a 16th of the group have taken an ethics class. How many people have taken an education class? Much more impressive. Um, so out of that group, how many overlapped, took ethics and education? One, two, three. That's sad. 
<laughs> well, I'm going to try to kind of talk about the intersection of those two areas. Um, my, my background is, um, is in applied ethics. But my, uh, my dissertation, my doctoral dissertation, was in Aristotle's conception of moral education. Um, and if you go back to Greek philosophy and study Aristotle, most people think of him as a scientist. Uh, but he was deeply, deeply concerned with the aesthetic experience as well. Um, so I want to just briefly, ever so briefly, since Juliet said you have about 15, 20 minutes. So I'm going to go over, you know, all of Western philosophy <laughs> into moral psychology and kind of wrap up for the rest of the panelists here within 15, 20 minutes. Um, just give you some ideas about what is the goal that we have within moral education. I realize my PowerPoint isn't even up there. That might have been helpful to start with that. Thanks, Dustin. <laughs> We're all at a disadvantage when it comes to computers. Um, so what I wanted to talk about were um, one specific topic, which is the values that shape today's college students. So values that shape today's college students. And I really want to start off by asking you a question and saying, do you think that there's any difference between the values of today's college students versus when you went to college? Um, I thought Juliet was going to be very kind and say, guess which one of the panelists is the current college student? But she didn't. I guess you all knew who the current college student was. Uh, for most of us, you know, people tend to think the older that they get, there's just a natural reaction to think that people have different value structures in the current generation of college students, and usually that they're worse, that it was better in the old days. Um, I, there's a little bit of truth to that, just a little bit of truth, but I'm really going to talk about um, an issue that I find really compelling and I think is important for um, aesthetic awareness within moral education, finding a source for common values. Um, for, for a long, long period of time, actually until the Enlightenment, most people thought there was a common source for goodness or values or justice that everyone could ascribe to the same kind of notion. All of a sudden during the Enlightenment, there was a shift in thinking and people started to kind of think, well, maybe there's not something common. And this really led to the rise of relativism. Um, this may sound a little esoteric, but trust me, it will hook back into the notion of um, um, art as a vehicle for moral education. Relativism is vastly on the increase in the world today. Um, my teaching with students, and I don't know if you even have come across this within your own teaching, but I teach bioethics, I teach business ethics, and I teach undergraduates. And when I ask a question about a dilemma, and I say, well, what should be done here? almost always the first response that I get is, well, I, I certainly couldn't give an answer. That's not something that I feel comfortable doing because there is, you know, everyone has their own understanding of what the right thing to do is. I'm going to challenge that a bit. Universality was a common concept, um, for, especially for the Greeks and for Aristotle. For Aristotle, he said, human beings are composed of different spheres, different parts of what comprise the, the being of a person. And, and again, Aristotle was a scientist, so he's trying to figure out, we look at a chair, what's the function of a chair? We look at a tree, what's the function of it? Look at a human being, what is the function of a human being? And he said, we have all these spheres that compose who we are as individuals. One is intellectual. It's just constitutive of who we are as a being. We always are curious. We're trying to figure things out. We're physical. We really like physical activities. We go on vacation and we do kooky things like kayaking or skiing or hiking. We like the physical. Um, social. We are social beings. It's the rare exception who doesn't really ever want to be around human beings. Some of us like a little more quiet, but most of us need at least some human contact. And then there's an aesthetic element. And for, for the Greeks in particular, they believed that the, the notion of understanding beauty and there was a concept of beauty. This isn't relative. There was, a, there was a definite idea, and we really see this in Plato. We get the idea of the, the idea of beauty that we see later, much, much later, in John Dewey's philosophy that is picked up on, that beauty is somehow linked up with the idea of justice. How do we figure out if something is right or wrong? For Dewey, he said, it's the same way that we have an understanding of beauty. 
I mean, what is beauty? It's proportion. It's symmetry in exactly the same way that we understand justice. It's the one thing I always nail students with when they say, there are no universal values. And I say, none? There's absolutely nothing that's universal? Absolutely not. Everything is dependent upon your culture. I always say, and I believe there are more than one universal values, but I say, well, what about justice? And it usually throws them because justice is that universal quality that everyone gets. It doesn't matter if you're in a village in Tibet or in Hanover, New Hampshire. People understand the notion of fairness. And they say, well, that's not fair if you do X, Y, or Z. We all get it. And it's, again, it's going back to the Greeks who said, why do we understand that? Because it's part of the rational component of being human. It's just part of who we, it's in our DNA that rationally we can figure things out. That hooks up again with the aesthetic, which for Dewey, who was the great educator of uh, modern educational theory, Dewey believed that art really was the great vehicle for moral education. It just kind of synced up with the idea of teaching people about morality. So, I know I'm going to run late, so I'll try to run through these. So what I wanted to do is kind of using that as a backdrop, talk a little bit about generational profiles. And <clears throat> it seems that there's a cottage industry now on generational values, that people are talking about what are the difference between values and generations. Generations are kind of a new concept anyway, something really fairly um, new within social psychology. But, we do know that there are certain tendencies that certain generations tend to have. So I'm going to go through just three, four of them. Um, and the first is just to give you a, a sampling of the types of values that people had. If you go back to the silent generation, people born between 1925 and 1942, it was a very distinct group of people. And I'm, I'm really focusing on the United States. So um, this may be different in different parts of the world, but in the United States, the, the study that we have of values is that they tended, these people tended towards democratic politics. Again, think of what was happening. This is, you know, uh, post-World War I, but deep into World War II. They married and parent, parented younger than any previous generation, um, and they experienced the effects of the Depression. So the pivotal moment for this generation was World War II, and it deeply influenced the value structures of these folks. Anybody Mad Men fans? Not many. I'm totally out of sync with this group. Um, it just started back up, and I thought one of the things that a, a panel I'm going to do next year is Mad Men morality. I'm tired of doing the esoteric stuff that nobody shows up for. We're going to do a panel on Mad Men morality. It's these guys. It was a really different understanding of the role of women, the role of work. Again, if you think of Mad Men, you can kind of get a, a snapshot of this group. But they were very big on family. This tends to be the grandparents of the students that we're teaching right now. Then we move into the most talked about generation of the modern era, boomers. I won't ask you to identify, but probably lots of boomers in this group. People born between 1943 and 1960. The thing that was unique about them is that these were the children that were born of the World War II veterans. There was a lot of education that was taking place because of the, the GI Bill. So a lot of people, for the very first time ever, were raising their children according to a book. And the book was Dr. Spock. Anybody remember what Dr. Spock said about 1970? when he was assessing all of the work that he had done on child development and child rearing. Oops. <laughs> he said, I, I think I, I may have overstepped the idea of autonomy. There probably shouldn't have been quite so much of an emphasis placed here. This generation is really interesting because it's so influential for the, the kids who are in college right now. Um, crime and substance abuse increased throughout their youth. Vietnam was the cutting, uh, was the um, pivotal experience of their youth. And cutting edge, edge behavior became part and parcel with the whole idea of learning on your own, doing what you felt was necessary to do. Educational trends changed completely. People no longer taught, I mean, there's a whole generation that never learned the rules of grammar because it was considered passe. You don't need to. Just kind of go and do whatever you want to do. Um, I, I, again, I, I, I show my bias here, but just recently, um, I forget which committee came out and said, we're no longer teaching cursive writing, which I just thought, oh, so sad. But no one can even write in cursive any longer. And part of that was the change in educational policies that took place during this period of time. I think Steve Jobs would be horrified by that, the man who studied calligraphy and got all the fonts for computers. Then we have this very short little generation 
And this generation was born between 1961 and 1981. And every time I do this, there's somebody in the, in the group who's in this, and they kind of go, oh, thanks. This is a very odd generational little niche. Um, they, were, they, te they tended to be the first wave of kids born to boomers that then got divorced. You know, they were still smoking a lot of dope. They were sort of unsure where they were going and got divorced, and they were going to do it right later down the road. So this group sort of fell through the cracks. Um, they tend to question authority. The majority of their parents are divorced. There's a lot of study indicating on the effect of the huge divorce rate during this period of, of time on this uh, generation of people. Evil child movies. There was just a rash of them. So, which was really indicative of the values of society at that time, that they really thought of them. And again, I go back to my Aristotelian roots. If you study, if you look at um, entertainment in a society, you can just immediately pick up the values. And if you look at movies right now, you look at television shows, there are so many television shows that deal with dead bodies or raped, mutilated women. I mean, it's, it's really indicative of the values that we have in society. Um, I won't go into this, but it's an interesting point. This was the largest immigration trend during their lifetime, and there tended to be a strong backlash. This is when we saw a lot of uh, trends against affirmative action, that kind of thing. Much less optimistic about the future than past generations. Then fast forward, millennials. All of a sudden, about 1983, the boomers kind of got it together. They said, OK, I'm on my second marriage. I finished graduate school. Now I'll have the baby, you know, the perfect baby. First time we ever see this little thing called baby on board, like, what was that about? OK, I won't crash into you. But it was, you know, <laughs> that this special little package was there. This, we, we tend to mark this group about 1982. And it's the first generation of kids who really were, uh, right now we're seeing, especially here at Dartmouth, lots and lots of singletons, only children. Uh, the parents were older when they gave birth to them. They spent a lot of money on IVF. They spent a lot. These are kids who um, uh, really like their parents. Their parents really wanted them. And they, they tend to be extremely close with them. Again, some of the values that we see with them is that you'll see kids walking across campus on their cell phone, and you'll hear, yes, mom, I just finished my exam. I think I did OK. And you think you go back to, again, go back to a previous generation, boomers in particular. Most parents didn't even see grades at the end of a term, let alone. We have parents here at Dartmouth who sadly have told me, I buy the books, my child's class, because we read along at the same time, to which I think most of us would respond, get a hobby, get a life. I mean, it's amazing. But they're incredibly close to their parents. So they struggle. But here are the things that are important about this generation. Um, and what I really want to emphasize is how this will fit in with, again, Dewey's conception of art as moral education is predicated on two factors. Well, one in particular, imagination. He said, the, the, the cultivation of imagination is critical to understand the aesthetic experience, hence to understand justice. So it's a vehicle for understanding moral principles. Now, look at some of the things about the millennial generation. We know, now, we don't know if it's just more diagnosis or actually more ADD or ADHD, but there's a lot of depression within this group, significant amount of depression. Um, but 82% report no family problems because they're so close to their parents. They, even if you look at their iPod, you'll see the same music. I mean, they're listening to The Doors. They're listening to The Beatles. They tend to be, you know, they, they're very, very similar to their parents. A very strong interest in religion, which is a side note, but it's interesting because it's not mainstream religion. Most of these kids are, are moving to extremely conservative religious bases. And partly the explanation in social psychology is that because they didn't have anything at all, when they suddenly become interested in religion um, and they've been so structured their whole life that they're drawn to things that are incredibly formulaic and very constrained. So if they were culturally Catholic, when they rediscover Catholicism, they want the Latin mass. They want, you know, if they were culturally Jewish, they want Orthodox Judaism. They, they go to a more extreme. Um, their heroes are identified as military heroes, um, and we have a huge increase in this generation of joining the military, and they are joining hardcore military. They're joining the Army. They're joining the, the Marines are the highest percentage for this generation, and they are not joining the Marines to be information officers. They want to go to Afghanistan. So there's a very strong push in that way. Um, they're stressed, ambitious, and sleep-deprived, and grade-driven. 
I put this in quotes, they are the smartest group of Americans because we have everything standardized with tests now. Um, they rationalized cheating. Cheating is on the increase. Rutgers has been doing a longitudinal study, and we find that this generation, the cheating rates are off the charts. Cheating is rampant in this group. Um, I put in red here, there's much more knowledge, but much less creativity. So if you don't have a prescribed assignment for kids, they freak out. How am I supposed to do that? You have to tell me exactly what to do. We have a minor in applied ethics, and there's a, there's a thesis they have to write. And when I say, you tell me what you want to do, they ah, panic. And they say, well, well, give me ideas, and tell me how long it has to be, and what I should be doing. This is a, a very new phenomenon that we have. And they demand a secure and regulated environment. They're very technologically savvy, which we'll hear about. But they're very, um, ten by political, I have little p political. They're politically conservative. These are kids who are doing a lot of kind of, you know, um, community service work. They really want to do good in the world, but not quite sure how to do it. They tend to be less politically engaged, although since the um, election of Obama, they've become more political. Um, I, I, I probably am running out of time, right? But I'm going to just briefly mention, going back to boomers, how do we teach kids about um, values? I couldn't get her all on there. Who is this? Sally, boy, you can tell the age of people when they, they know it's Sally. Who do we have here? Dick and Jane. Yes. If you, how many people use this reader? I just showed this to a colleague of mine, and the anthrop we were just talking yesterday. And I was, I, was, I had these books in my hand, and she said, "What's that?" And um, I said, "Oh, I said they're Dick and Jane, isn't this great?" And she said, "What's Dick and Jane?" And I thought, "Oh, I feel so old you know, that she had no clue who Dick and Jane were." These were readers that um, mo they were first grade readers, and there was just an um, an exhibit in, I think it was a few years ago, I think in like um, Iowa, and it was a museum that somebody pulled out the artist who did all the Dick and Jane series, and they really thought it would be a marginal reception. They were overwhelmed. They said they couldn't, I mean, they, it was just flocks of people coming. But the weirdest part was people would cry when they looked at it. Why? Because it evoked their childhood. And if you look, if you think back to Dick and Jane, what were the titles of the book? We Work was one of them. And if you think about it, it's incredibly sexist. All you have to do is go back. It's incredibly sexist to read these. But the values were embedded within the reader. So for a whole generation of people, you saw Dick, there, were, there was mother and father who didn't have names, but father went to work in a suit and he had his briefcase. And mother had a nice frilly apron and she was at home all the time. Dick, Jane, and Sally, and Spot, and Puff the cat. So that was the world. Everything you learned within those readers was about the social world of the of 1950s, 1960s. The values were embedded about working, about helping, um, constantly played through. The artist who did this series took all of her designs out of the Sears catalog because they wanted to hit middle America. So if you look at them, they're really incredible. And I'll just jump forward very quickly to what did this generation grow up with. And just notice the, the difference here. What's the biggest difference? They're not human. Nobody is human. And I, I'm going to end with this um, by simply saying that there was a study that was done in the 1940s, I think it was, of third graders across the country. And it was a very simple study. And it, it was uh, trying to determine who, was, who were heroes, which is a a morally fraught term anyway. Uh, so they asked all these third graders, uh, again, wide spectrum of kids, who their heroes were. And they had like the top five heroes. Who do you think was number one in 1940? Superman. Nope, not Superman. Dad. Dad was number one. They replicated the study in the, I think, the early 1980s. Same kind of sampling. Where was Dad? He was no longer in the top 10 nor was mom, nor was any real human being. They were all fictional characters. So it, it, what I want to kind of leave you with is in, the, in moral education, again, I go back to the Greek roots, but I really bring it up to modern contemporary theory. If we look at Dewey, what we give to children, children learn through pictures. We know they learn through pictures, and the pictures usually attach to stories. If the stories and the pictures 
this is great, you know, if you want to do this, but it, you, you get a different end product. And I'm not saying we need to go back to Dick and Jane. We probably don't. Dick and Jane even tried to update. I think in the uh, late 1960s, they had a new series that came out where um, Sally said things like, no, I won't do it. And nobody <laughs> liked it. You know, it was just like, no, that doesn't work. You know, Sally is, just needs to be Sally. So, but we, but we should be really thinking about the aesthetic experience that we give to children and how that translates into how they view the world. And again, I, uh, with, with little time, but it will be touched on in all of the, the panelists who speak, this um, important element in Dewey and conceptions of, of moral education, I think is really critical. I don't have an answer for it. I don't work in early childhood education. But I know with college students that they still really fixate on, on the notion of pictures and stories aligned with them. So with that, I will leave it and we'll move on to the next person. I'll take Sponge Bob off there. I'm constitutionally incapable of standing behind a podium unless I'm chained there and Juliet forgot the chains, so. <laughs> Recently, I was asked to write an article as a contribution to the inaugural uh, publication of a new journal called the Journal of General Education. And the assignment was a little bit peculiar uh, because we were asked to read E.O. Wilson's latest book, The Social Conquest of Earth, and to react to it in the context of general education, uh, and joined as we were by the subtitle of this journal, A Curricular Commons of the Sciences and the Humanities. Wilson, as you may know, is an eminent Harvard entomologist who has spent most of his life studying social insects, ants and bees, but in the last 20 years has turned his attention to the social creature that has come to dominate even more ecological niches on Earth, and that is humans. And Wilson argues quite convincingly in this book that the evolution of humans as a social species is fundamentally genetic, not just a cultural artifact. He postulates various hypotheses in this book. Uh, one of them is an, his iron rule of social genetic evolution. And that is that while a selfish individual will always win out over an altruistic individual, a group of altruists will always win out over a group of selfish people. This, he argues, convincingly, is a consequence of the evolution of our brain. The structure of our brain has been evolving for about a million years in hominid species, and a million years is a long time. It has given us a brain where the language production center and the language recognition center are very close to each other on the left side, and they're hardwired together. That is, they're designed for two-way communication. A large part of the real estate of the cortex is devoted to picking up very subtle social cues verbal and nonverbal ones. If I'm looking at you and you may be a foe, I'm registering whether or not your pupils are dilating even though I'm not consciously seeing it because the fusiform gyrus has a huge part of the brain recognizing subtle facial social cues. We are hardwired to be social interacting creatures. And as Wilson argues with his story about the altruists and the selfish people, we also have a brain that's hardwired for collaboration, for working together. And this evolved over the 99.9% .9 of the last uh, million years or so in which people were organized into social groups of, he uses the number 30, doesn't justify that number, but a few dozen individuals in small hunter-gatherer societies. So how do we take advantage of this new knowledge of the brain and its evolution in education? Well, what we do is we anoint a sage on the stage who does strictly one-way communication, while you all sit there passively and I talk at you. Uh, we completely desocialize the situation, no talking or laughing over there, leave two seats between everybody during the exam. Uh, and we, of course, foster most of all in institutions such as this, competition instead of collaboration for meaningless numerical scores. <laughs> competition versus collaboration. The British educator Ken Robinson has a wonderful way of putting this. He says, when a bunch of people get together, and they work really hard on a difficult problem, and they come up with a brilliant solution to it. In university, it's called cheating, right? In life, it's called collaboration, but in university, it's called cheating. So 
how could we imagine doing this somewhat differently? Well, it's almost impossible for us. I mean, like we've always done it this way. I mean, you can imagine this small hunter-gatherer group 10,000 years ago on the verge of the Neolithic Revolution, and a few of the kids get to the age where they really have to start contributing, and they have to learn, you know, which are the poisonous berries and which are the good ones to collect, and how to set a snare to catch small game, and, you know, how to work together to hunt a zebra and slaughter it and roast the haunch for dinner. And so clearly what they did in those days, the elders sat them down on hard lods and lectured at them for 13 weeks, right? That's... <laughs> well, the fact that you laugh at that suggests you don't think that's the way it was. And yet the brains of the undergraduates that you're teaching today are indistinguishable from the structure of the brains of those Neolithic hunter-gatherers 10,000 years ago. And so why not think about using to your advantage the notion that we're hardwired for two-way communication, that we are fundamentally social creatures, and that there is an inherent desire to collaborate. I had a rare opportunity, starting eight, nine years ago now, to participate in the design of a university from scratch. With a blank piece of paper, how would one design a university for the moral creatures that we just heard about today who are digital natives growing up in a culture that celebrates multitasking and who are immersed in a world with extremely difficult problems that are not going to yield to single disciplinary solutions. The result of this exercise is Canada's first independent secular university, Quest University Canada. And it has some interesting different features that I thought I'd share with you because I think it provides some food for thought as to how things might be done differently in higher education. We had to think of a number of things in designing Quest. One is physically designing the campus, and it turns out integrating that process, the physical design of the space, and the curriculum, the delivery method, and the institutional structure are worth thinking about at the same time. So the institutional structure. We started by deciding that the principal organizing structure of this institution would be that we would have no departments. Been in an Ivy League institution for a very long time, I know departments are the source of all evil. And so if you're going to design a new university, why not just get rid of them altogether? And furthermore, why not build that spirit into the architecture of the building such that our academic building is a circular building and we assign the offices to faculty by lottery. And so we have a mathematician sitting next to a poet, sitting next to a neuroscientist, sitting next to an economist, sitting next to a philosopher. And believe it or not, they actually talk to each other. You know, the process, all, these, all our faculty have PhDs. The process of getting a PhD, as you well know, is the process of learning more and more about less and less until you know absolutely everything about nothing. <laughs> and the problem is that most people get stuck in that funnel, and departments only reify that notion that you should continue writing those articles that one other person in the world will read for the rest of your life. But suppose you're sitting between a neuroscientist and a mathematician, of the musician on the other side. Perhaps you might think in different ways. Perhaps you might remember why you went into academia in the first place, and that is because you like to learn stuff, and maybe you could learn new stuff. And so maybe what emerges from our tone-deaf mathematician sitting next to our enumerate music professor is a course on the mathematics of music, where the two faculty members teaching jointly model the process of learning for the students that they're talking to. And so, no departments. The second thing we had to think about was what we were going to teach in our curriculum. And having gone to a liberal arts institution, having taught at a liberal arts institution, we thought we'd do the liberal arts. But we do it in a slightly different way. Rather than using classical tests, texts alone, we would take classical texts and apply them in contemporary situations. How would we deliver this curriculum? There the structure of the building was also equally important we would take advantage of Wilson's notion about the way the brain evolved. We would not have any lecture halls. We have an entire university with not a single lecture hall. Every classroom is a small classroom with an oval table in the middle in which there are at most 21 chairs, one for the faculty member, or sometimes two or three for faculty members, and 16 or 18 for the students. In every classroom, everybody sits down. In every classroom, we have two-way communication. I mean, look at what happens here, right? We have, here we have a whole auditorium, and we have all these chairs are completely empty, right? We have some brave people over here. So I don't know, wh wh why did you sit in the front row? Michael Taylor made me. Oh, I see. 
That's what I figured. So you weren't expecting any two-way communication, right? You wanted to sit there passively and just listen to me talk and listen to everybody else talk. That's not a recipe for learning according to the way our brains are designed. The tables themselves were critically important. We argued for a week about what kind of tables we were going to get in these rooms. And we ended up with six-part tables. They're a big oval with two end pieces and four in the middle. And they're all on wheels. And so you can reconfigure the classroom at will. You can reconfigure it so you can have small groups working together, or you can wheel it back together so everyone can have a discussion. Each of these classrooms has across the hall breakout rooms with just four chairs, a whiteboard, and a small table where you can send students off to work together to collaborate the way our brains are wired, and then to come back and bring the consequences of their collaboration back to the classroom such that the fruits of their thoughts can be shared with everyone else. People can work on different parts of a problem and ultimately solve something together. My favorite example of this is in a math class. So we have a core curriculum at this institution, which is two years long. And it's equally weighted in the math, the sciences, the social sciences, the humanities, and the arts. Everybody takes all those courses. Everybody takes a math course. But we don't teach math courses like, you know, algebra or geometry or calculus or linear algebra. I mean, we teach those courses for upper division students. But for the first two years, people take math courses like patterns in nature and problem solving and spherical trigonometry. Now, you probably, none, how many people here, I can ask you the question thing, how many people have had spherical trigonometry? I bet it's zero, yeah, it's zero, okay. Spherical trigonometry is not a subject that's taught in any university in North America, to my knowledge, today. It was, however, at the beginning of the 19th century, a major intellectual development, because trigonometry on the surface of a sphere is different than trigonometry on a flat plane, the way some of you probably learned it, and indeed is essential for accurate surveying and accurate navigation. GPS does not work without spherical trigonometry, and yet no one today knows how to do it. We happen to have a math professor who's in love with spherical trigonometry, and he uses this, as we do all our other foundation courses, not to pump information into the students. Information is readily available. We have this thing called the web, you know, and you just type into the upper right-hand corner. Unfortunately, some of today's students confuse the notion of thinking and typing into the upper right-hand corner of their browser. I had a Columbia student who once in tears of frustration said, but Professor Helfand, I Google your problems and nothing comes back. You know, <laughs> how can I possibly solve them? Because she had confused thinking with typing into the upper right-hand corner of her browser. <laughs> Spherical trigonometry is used to illustrate the way a mathematician asks questions about the world and goes about trying to answer them. And our foundation program does that in all spheres, in art, in music, in economics, in political philosophy, in physics, and chemistry, and life sciences. It asks, how does someone trained in the life sciences ask a question about the world and go about trying to answer them? So in the spherical trig class, people take this class because clearly the professor is so in love with spherical trigonometry that they just rub off. They get these lucite spheres, and they carry them around like pets. You know, they go to the cafeteria with them, and they draw their triangles on them. Last two Decembers ago, this professor, who has just published a book with Princeton University Press on the development of spherical trigonometry, has taught this class six times in three different institutions, really knows spherical trigonometry, was presenting to a bunch of first-year students in December, that's their fourth month of school, none of them going to be math majors, because we don't have majors, but anyway, none of them particularly interested in math, just interested in intellectual experience, presented a theorem published in 1807 and reproduced in every spherical trigonometry textbook ever since. And by the end of the class, the students had found a logical flaw that had escaped mathematicians for 200 years, and Glenn had to withdraw his galley proofs from Princeton, change them, and add his class to the acknowledgments for having advanced the field. This is what you can achieve if you take advantage, rather than fight against, the evolution of the brain as a two-way communication machine designed to work in a socialized environment where collaboration is celebrated over competition. So we have small classes, seminar style, engage students. The other thing we do is take a direct hit at the modern fallacy of multitasking. Your brain does not multitask. I mean, the primitive parts of your brain, I, my heart's beating and I'm breathing and I'm talking at the same time, but your prefrontal cortex is a serial processor. Unlike your laptop, which has four little processors and therefore can do four things at the same time, your prefrontal cortex can only do one thing at a time. And this is why driving and texting and talking on the phone is good for the gene pool, because you will die, and that will eliminate your genes from the <laughs> process. 
because your brain switches from one thing to another. And so we wanted to attack that full on, and so we adopted a system first devised by Colorado College in 1970, the block system, where students take one class at a time. I, of course, was highly skeptical of this, having grown up in a culture of semesters, having taught for 35 years in semesters, it's obviously the right thing, way to do things, right? And so I said, ah, oh, yeah, I see how this would work in an English class, because you could like, do one of the history plays of Shakespeare, and you could read the play, and you could read the history that went with it, you could do the linguistics, you could even put on the play, you could really get into this, uh, but of course it'll never work in physics. You know, because in physics there's all these ideas, and they're sequential, and you have to absorb them, and they connect to each other, and so I'm very amused now when I go back to Columbia to sing the praises of the block system to my colleagues in the English department who always initially look at me and say, yeah, I see how that would work in science. It would never work in English, of course, right? <laughs> Everyone knows it won't work in their discipline until they try it. Because what it achieves is a level of engagement that is literally orders of magnitude different than one gets in a semester-based classroom. Because when you walk into class that first day at 9 o'clock in the morning, and the classes are three hours long at minimum and, some, and run for three and a half weeks, the professor and the students all know there's nothing else to do except that subject. They don't have to go home at night and decide which book they're going to read work first or which paper they're going to read. They just are going to do one thing, and they're going to focus on that. And that's how you can get a bunch of first-year students to figure out there's an error in a proof of a 200-year-old theorem because they become completely immersed in this occupation. And then the next month it switches, and they're in some completely different occupation. They come equally immersed in that. It has the other advantage, of course, that there's no constraints. If I want to keep the students for 24 hours, it's not a problem, because they don't have a chemistry lab that day in the afternoon. They don't have an English paper due the following day. And so if you want to study developmental economics, you could do it out of a textbook in British Columbia, or you could take the entire class to Belize for three and a half weeks and do it in a develop developing country. Guess which is more effective? If you're studying volcanoes, you can do it in a classroom out of a textbook, or you can climb up the mountain behind the campus, bring a few samples back to the lab after an overnight trip, analyze them, and then fly off to the Volcano National Observatories in Hawaii and work with scientists working on Kilauea uh, in real time. If you want to study music, you can immerse yourself 24 hours a day. We had a wonderful visiting professor from Dartmouth, actually, uh, who gave a music class, and part of the exercise was a week without music. The students were forced to go without music entirely for a week. And since they had nothing else to do, it wasn't like they had to put their headphones on while they were doing their chemistry lab report. They were just thinking about what it was like to have a week without music. This complete immersion is the kind of learning that, of course, of course occurred when you were teaching a bunch of young people 10,000 years ago how to set snares. You didn't say, oh, the bell didn't ring after 75 minutes. You kept at it until you got it right. It also allows us to bring in people who don't normally teach in universities and can't take four months out of their lives, but can take three and a half weeks out of their lives. So we have professional artists and photographers, uh, diplomats and research scientists who come out of their labs, out of their studios, out of their embassies, and come and teach a course for three and a half weeks and share their expertise with our students. It's a different model, and it takes advantage of the fact that we are wired for two-way communication, that we're wired to exist in a social milieu, and that we have evolved such that we're most successful when we're collaborating. And it strikes me that the opportunities you have in museums to draw students in and engage them in that sort of way would make education vastly more effective. Now, as I was driving up here last night, I was trying to think of ways uh, to actually opera opera operationalize, is that a word? Yeah. To, to put into operation the kind of engaged learning that we do in you know, my science classroom. And just two exits before I got off for Hanover, I, I, I thought of something. And it's a little techy, but hey, I'm a physicist. What do you expect? But it's the kind of thing you might think about. Undoubtedly, those of you who have lectured, a hopelessly ineffective form of communication, as I hope I'm demonstrating now, you have lectured <laughs> to students about how an artist use color and line and shape to draw your eye in a pattern around the painting. But of course, 
We know that is physically true by using the little eye tracker laser, you know, silver contact lens you can put in and track the way the eye moves. Suppose instead of telling a student that, you brought the students in, you gave them the hardware, you gave them a painting, and say, okay, let's take some data on how you look at the painting. They say, what are you, I look at the painting, I just look at the painting. Well, no, actually your eye, you know, moves around a lot when you're moving, and so you could teach them how the saccades work, how your eye's stationary and then jumps around, and then you could actually have them track each other's eyes as they looked at a painting. And you could do that over a bunch of people, over different paintings, and you could have them derive for themselves how the artists use color and line to draw your eye around the painting and tell a story to your brain. There are probably a number of other things you could do too. Another one that occurred to me later last night was a beautiful sculpture of a calf. You know, you could have the feel, students blindfolded and have them feel the calf, and then you could have them feel the calf of their neighbor. They'd probably really get into this, the undergraduates. Uh, there's things you can do to inv evolve, involve the students in the work. This is not a new idea. This is not rocket science. Confucius said it a long time ago. Tell me and I will forget. That's our current model of education. Show me and I will remember. Involve me and I will understand. And I think the way to capture these generation, which has deficient moral character, as we've just heard, <laughs> is to involve them so they come to understand, to treat them as the social creatures that they are, to let them work together collaboratively, to sit down instead of stand and talk at them, to have them with their hands on objects or on machines that allow them to understand the way their eye and their brain visualizes art, to involve them in the process, and as a result, to educate them in the Latin, Latin sense. Education comes from educatus, educare. Educare does not mean to pour information from a full vessel to an empty one and hope it sticks. Educare means to open up and lead forth. That should be the goal of our education. And that can be the goal, that can be an achieved goal if you design the spaces and the processes that take advantage of the way our brain has evolved. Thank you. Hi, everyone. So first of all, I'd just like to say how humble I feel to be on this panel with such distinguished speakers. And um, I guess today I'm just going to offer you kind of a student perspective of someone who started out participating in one of the Hood's extracurricular courses in my sophomore year and coming back my junior year here as an intern going on to intern at the MFA in Houston and then finally deciding to go on and get my PhD in art history. And so in some ways the hood has played such a foundational role in, in my decision to, to move into this kind of professional track. And so I'd just like to share with you kind of two key programs that I've been involved in at the hood, the first one being Museum Collecting 101, which is an extracurricular course um, that's a month long, uh, has five weekly sessions, oh, month and one, five weeks long, five weekly sessions, and it's been running every winter since 2001. And the purpose is basically to gather a group of students from all disciplines across campus, usually around 12 to 20 students, in order to come together and discuss um, about what objects are there in the Hood's collection and to expand the collection by buying one additional object. And I'll be discussing that process soon. And the second thing is looking back at Earth, which in some ways is a culmination of the environmental photography that has been collected over the years by this museum collecting class. And this show was a show that Kathy Hart here and I co-curated um, last summer. And in the end, I'll just like to summarize with some kind of fancy conceptual framework I've put over everything. <laughs> and so first of all, uh, Museum Collecting 101. And I just, I know that there, we did a presentation this yesterday, but um, I just like to share this with the whole group. And kind of the structure of the course is that in the first session, the students are brought in and 
Kathy and the museum staff talks to them about the history of the museum and the history of its collection because Dartmouth, um, the, the Hood Museum at Dartmouth actually gathers a rather disparate array of objects from anthropology, from, fi from fine arts, and of course has a very long history of you know, colonial collecting and things like that as well. And also talking about the acquisitions policy of the museum, what, what is the process that it takes for an object to go from the artist onto the walls, and, and really you know, giving an idea of, to students, including me at that time, who had been in a museum once before, um, about you know, really the inner workings of the museum and the kinds of roles that the, the staff within the museum play in, in carrying and making, sh and making sure that the object you know, gets a sustained life and gets its interaction over the years, thinking of how what we collect can be used for teaching and for curricular connections. And in the second session, um, we lay out you know, the objects in the areas that we would like to collect. So for instance, in this 2011 class, um, we were looking at contemporary photography. And this was you know, some of the selection of the objects that we already have in the collection. And we do this exercise called the token exercise. I'm sure some of you know of this already. But we get small little kind of post-its that have little shapes on them. So like um, a house, a dollar sign, um, a spider web. And so the house would mean this is the piece that I want to bring home. A dollar sign being this is a piece I think would be valuable on the art market. Spider webs being something like this would have the most curricular connections. And I think it forces everyone to kind of delineate what they mean when they say I like or I don't like this object and really identifying what kinds of values that they bring to, to each piece and whether if, you know, and really differentiating the I like this object from this object should be in the museum's collection and how it will serve the student population, the faculty, the community for the many, many years to come. And in the third session, um, the staff presents, you know, 10 photographers that uh, they're considering, they've already called down. And in some ways, this is in part limited by funding because we have around $5,000 to buy the object in the end. And in the fourth session, the students talk and debate and narrow it down to one photographer. And in the fifth session, they select a work by that photographer to enter the collection. And this was the work we selected the first year I participated, which is um, a piece by an American photographer, J. Henry Fair. And one of the reasons I think this photograph struck out to us so much was that um, we, we spent a long time talking about how it looked similar to abstract expressionist paintings and how we thought this was kind of magma or lava flow and we thought this would relate to geography. But then, um, because at first we didn't actually have the caption. But realizing afterwards that this is actually um, contaminated wastewater with arsenic coming from a coal power plant in South Carolina. And, and really how you know, documentary images are powerful in that way and that in the context of you know, popular science and in, in venues where you would expect these kinds of images to be in illustrating you know, some facts about global warming that, you know, in some ways, by putting it into a museum context and making people think more closely and look more closely about one image that we come to understand the kind of visual rhetoric that it's using to construct um, the argument about environmentalism, but also what kinds of traditions of, of visual history and culture it, it plays into. And in the end, you know, the students who participate in selecting this got our names put into the credit line for, for this object, which I think was, uh, was wonderful in, in feeling that we were all involved in really perpetuating you know, the, the, the museum's mission, really, and, making sh and we know that this object will be used for teaching in, in the classes that actually some of the people within the group have already taken, such as a geography class that actually um, on uh, climate change and global warming that actually comes in and teaches with this class. And kind of 
the, the following year, I, I came back and flipped sides, going to uh, becoming part of the team that helped organize the next year's Museum Collecting 101. And it was also a different kind of process of involvement, I feel, and one that was very privileged to have. And that was just simply going out on the internet and finding you know, the wealth of, of documentary photography that's going on, in, whether if it's by photojournalists or by video artists or you know, by, by contemporary artists who you know, practice such, in such a wide range of media, photography being among one of them. And I think that, of course, Museum Collecting 101 was designed as this kind of short-term course for Dartmouth students who have no time. But um, in, in an ideal world, I feel that you know, this, this, really, this pro initial process of really going out and immersing myself within you know, the, the, the vast majority of images there is out there was, was very helpful. And so these are some of the uh, kind of sample images by photographers that we presented to students in 2012. And this was a piece we acquired by Patricia McDonald, who's um, a Scottish photographer, and Ian Tay, who's a British-born Chinese photographer. And I think this was one of the key areas where the students actually, having learned of that institutional history of collecting environmental photography over the years, identified the fact that so many of the photographs we collected were basically by white American males and mostly of North America or South America. And really this year, you know, there, there were so many discussions about how environmental history as a, as a discipline, if one might even call it that, is, you know, offers the humanities a way of looking across nation-based histories, nation-based art histories into kind of a consideration of what, what a broader global ecosystem of things means. And, and I think that was reflected in, in the kinds of discussions and choices that we made in, in selecting these two kind of non-American and uh, female photographer. And um, what came out of these collecting classes was this show, Looking Back at Earth. And in some ways, I think it testifies to how an organic growth of the collection that's driven by student and faculty interests surprisingly ends up in a rather coherent collection that, that you know, once it gains a certain kind of critical mass and once we present it in this exhibition form and faculty come to know about it, that it suddenly becomes kind of this hotbed where you know, so many classes now from creative writing to geography to earth sciences to engineer, uh, engineering sciences are all kind of dipping in and, and really utilizing this collection. And the process of you know, coming up with this exhibition itself was, was very collaborative, me working with Kathy Hart, but also drawing in um, professors from environmental studies, studio art, and students in those areas, but also students living at the Sustainable Living Center here at Dartmouth, who are clearly very involved in the kind of um, campus activities and activism related to environmental issues. And, and it, was, it was an interesting dialogue process that went on for several months about what can a show of environmental photography do? And I think the most traditional answer would be it's kind of a call to action. This, this is just you know, to, to make people aware of these facts. But um, I think that you know, from the museum side of things, I think we saw it as a way of um, making people think more critically about how the earth is being presented. We're not just showing you know, an earth in disarray, but really questioning what it means for that rhetoric of disarray to have been created by environmental photographers over time. But it was interesting to hear the students from engineering studies and environmental studies especially, because they were like, these images are great, but they're so depressing. We're all, we're, all we are about here is you know, about creating innovative solutions, sustainable design. I think that's, that's what students from an engineering background and design thinking focus on. And, and you know, we really took that to heart. And um, these were kind of two, image, two photographs that we acquired later, uh, which is actually by one of our um, 
faculty members in studio art uh, that, that you know, looks about sustainable energy practices and documenting those. And so that, that, that conversation in itself was interesting in thinking why environmental photographers do not produce works that are about these solutions or that they, they, this genre of work seems to be not so collected or doing not so well in the market. And in some ways, it, it goes to show the kinds of institutional priorities that museums and collectors bring to this genre of environmental photography itself that we, some, for, for some strange reason, we love to look at depressing images that are beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> and um, so here are some images of um, the exhibition itself when it came up. And it was organized in kind of thematic sections. This one, for instance, being about um, sustainable and unsustainable practices, so different kinds of farming practices, and results of you know deforce, uh, desertification due to over farming. This section is called Arctic Tracks, looking at you know the effects of global warming creating water tracks and glaciers. The middle image by Shubankar Banerjee, being of caribou migration tracks, but it's really hard to see. The more prominent tracks are actually the ones that are running you know, across the image here, which are actually uh, the tracks of trucks that are running across this kind of pristine landscape and setting up oil drilling rigs on the shore of Alaska. And the last one being Diane Burko, which is a piece that Michael Taylor helped acquire, uh, talking about glacier melting as well. And so here are just you know, some more images of, of the exhibition. And these are kind of, this is just kind of a sample of, of the classes that um, have been using this collection since, uh, since the show came up. And Terry Tempest Williams is a visiting faculty member who does environmental writing and creative writing. And here is also in their course in geography, looking at qualitative methods, and one more in engineering sciences on climate change. And so in some ways, kind of, I've kind of given you an overview of what I've done, and now I'm going to try to put it into some sort of perspective. And what I think is interesting in building up this collection concentrated on environmental photography, which I would liken to this pie I have, up here is really that it promotes so many kinds of entryways into the collection. And looking at Museum Collecting 101, for instance, it really begins with personal engagement and using those tokens to identify the values that we bring to certain images. And then, you know, being in a museum setting, being with, you know, Kathy Hart and museum staff and learning about close looking and how we, and how that object itself is created, and moving on towards considering the theme that we selected, which is environmental photography, and talking about the issues that contemporary environmental photographers bring to the table. And in the end, you know, when thinking about what contribution we're making to the collection as a whole, talking about the ideology of this collection and what, what kinds of you know, histories are embedded into the objects that go in and out of the collection. But at the same time, when I step back to the other side of the table and help co-curate the show, the circle kind of flipped around. And it began with really ideological critique, as I said earlier, about thinking what an exhibition on environmental photography means and, and what kinds of values we're bringing to a larger audience, a public audience. With, with the kind of argument we're constructing with an exhibition. And drawing in, as I said earlier, um, people from various departments who are interested in issues, specific issues that these objects are dealing with. And of course, promoting through kind of individual engagement with, with the exhibition later uh, onwards. And, and you know, I, the, the interesting thing about you know, a, a model like this, though, is that it's dynamic in the way that the circle itself is being changed by the students, and that students coming in from any four corners of um, 
of this diagram really are, are the students, kind of the broad variety of students that come into Museum Collecting 101. And they bring in very different priorities and interests uh, into what we already have. And really, you know, them being able to jump in at these various points and contribute to the discussion, I think um, is, is very important. And the fact that by organically building you know, a, a collection over time, that it slowly creates really an ecosystem where you know, faculty members who have been involved with this come back and become more closely involved over time. And there ends up being a kind of discursive, this density that, that is created by, by the courses that over time have been designed to take into consideration the collection that we have as an integral part of the syllabus. And, and of course, that takes a long time. And this has been ongoing since 2001, as I said. So it, it, it is a long process. And finally, I just like to end with this idea of an ecosystem of ownership. And I feel that this is what I gained the most um, being a student who was involved in this process. And I think talking to other students uh, who went through Museum Collecting 101 as well, is that by making the collection itself, uh, the ownership of the collection itself, um, even if it's just a few images open to students, to faculty who um, are involved, it gives us a sense that you know, the museum really is an open resource that we can come in and use, and that you know, there, there's, there's no longer a sense that we come into the museum to be taught something about a certain image, but that we're really using that image for, for additional inquiry on our own terms in some way. And I think that, you know, I, I just like to connect this with an experience I had working at the MFA in Houston last year. And we were talking about digitizing the collection. And I, I was in charge of presenting about how other museums have done that and how in some cases they have pictures uh, of uh, images of objects in the collection floating around Tumblr and Pinterest and people sharing and tagging them. And some of the curators were kind of appalled by that. <laughs> and you know, the question I raised to them was then, so what is the value of owning images today in museums when the images I have shown of the environment are readily, readily accessible elsewhere in popular science magazines and other contexts that would actually reach a bigger audience. So why are we spending money to buy these images? And I think the, the crucial issue is that uh, we need to create an ecosystem that the museum you know, serves as a hub for which the image can enter and create connections within this you know, kind of system of distribution that's very different from the system of distribution that goes on on the internet with image sharing, because here we're really focused on, you know, close looking, attentive looking, and really unravel, giving attention to the things that um, would, we would normally just glance at and think are, you know, beautiful but depressing images of the world. And so I'll leave you with that. Hi there, uh, my name is Matthew Battles, and uh, I want to thank Juliet. Um, I just echo the thanks of others, uh, both for the invitation and the, the engagement um, with, this, with this conference um, generally and, and with this group uh, um, at the table. Um, uh, I, I have to say, you know, and Kenji's uh, words uh, uh, were, were um, gratifying, but I'm kind of daunted at going after an undergraduate. Um, <laughs> Uh, 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 even even if they have no moral center, uh, um, uh, uh, I think we saw quite a moral center there, despite um, generational proclivities, right? And I, I should uh, maybe add a caveat about my own generational proclivities. I'm you know part of that generation X, um, which I think we were you know among those in the classroom when grammar was thrown out the window. Um, so is it we or us, actually? I'm not, <laughs> if, if, you know, any bloopers or infelicities, you know, uh, blame a boomer, okay? Um, and, you know, this, this um, so much of what we've been talking about and seeing in the Hood Museum has, has um, kind of been 
uh, churning my thinking um, uh, over the last day and a half. I, I, I've gone back and, and taken slides out of my presentation and added new ones and rearranged them. And even just now at the table, I've been rearranging slides in my head, which I don't actually have a way to do. Um, and might want to borrow the eye tracking hardware, David, um, and see if I could do something with that. But uh, what I'm going to try to do is I've got some slides that um, document some projects that my group, um, Metal Lab at Harvard, has been involved with. Um, and I want to sort of show you some of that work um, and, and, and see to what extent we can think about some of that work um, uh, in, in terms of spaces for learning, uh, spaces for learning and teaching, um, and in particular in, in, in terms of enacting some of the, some of the values that, that we've talked about, we've, we've, we've um, been exploring in the panel already. Um, because I think uh, uh, infusing technology in, in learning uh, gives you opportunities actually to explore ethical questions. Uh, it gives you opportunities to um, uh, uh, to explore the kind of cognitive uh, proclivities that we are endowed with by virtue of being a, 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 a peculiarly in, uh, evolved species. Um, these are not because technology is, is magical, but quite the opposite, because it's cultural, uh, because it's um, artifactual, because we make technology. Um, and I'll get into a little bit more about what I mean by that um, in, a, in a few minutes. Um, uh, at, a number of times people have asked me what Metal Lab is, this group that I'm a part of at Harvard, and I've had a hard time coming up with like a, an elevator pitch for it, a sentence or two that describes it. Um, but I realized when David was talking about um, hunter-gatherers that we, that's what we are. We're, we're like a hunter-gatherer band, you know, roaming Harvard Yard. Um, uh, uh, and we have some similarities, I think, with Neolithic bands. I mean, we're very small, it's a very small group. Um, not several dozen, just about a dozen um, uh, fluctuating team in that way. There's no real hierarchy, um, and, and, and we don't have any funding, which I think was a problem for Neolithic hunters as well. So, um, so, so there's a real similarity there. And I think that similarity is, I mean, jokes aside, I think there's a deep um, affinity uh, between some of the ways in which we um, have, have learned to go about um, collaborative uh, learning and teaching um, across the university and, and some of these other kinds of cognitive and social and cultural affordances um, that, that we don't maybe take advantage of in our um, institutions uh, to the extent we might, in our physical spaces in those institutions to the extent we might. So I'm beginning with this image. It's a kind of classic depiction of um, uh, academic training in art, right? And, and, um, and I'm, I'm, I like this image um, because you know, it, it, this is, looks like a nice Neolithic band of hunters again here. Um, but the, the, the image is infused with technology, and we don't necessarily see it as infused with technology in the first instance. Um, but there's a lot of technology going on here. Um, I think, you know, when, when, uh, when we were looking uh, at images of the Richardsonian uh, building that's the kind of once and future um, Hood Museum yesterday, that too was a space infused with technology. Technology for the handling of, of light, um, you know, technology uh, brought about by changes in the way iron was manufactured and, 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 and deployed architecturally um, and and these are our impacts or uh, a kind of dialogue with the material that our institutions have been um, a part of our teaching and learning um, practices have been a part of our knowledge production um, uh, traditions have been in dialogue with all along it's a kind of predicament of the modern so you know something that we often um, run into uh, at, at Metal Lab, when we when we go out to talk to people in departments about um, uh, infusing technology in teaching and learning and in research, um, is you know the sense you often hear um, in institutional settings that well we know that this change is coming, so we better get on board, right? Um, it's not a refrain that I've heard a lot here, which is is refreshing. I, I feel like I'm you know among a group of people who, who get it in a fundamental way um, that that it's it's not about um, institutional survival, but it's about opportunities. Um, and, and so, um, you know, I just want to underscore that uh, dealing with technology and infusing technology into teaching and learning is, is nothing new in the galleries and the museums and the academies of art um, uh, in institutions more, more broadly. Um, uh, and I like bringing Charles Wilson Peel into the picture here with this great kind of glowering kind of come hither um, 
come hither or else, I think, is how it, I think it felt that way to Raphael, anyway, those of you who know the Peels. Um, so this is a self-portrait of Peel, who's such a foundational figure in the life of museums in American culture um, in the sort of federal period. Um, and, uh, and, you know, the thing that I like about Peel and his museum is that it manifests interdisciplinarity, but I mean, it's an anachronism to say that, isn't it? Because this was interdisciplinary before there, there was disciplinarity, right? Um, you know, when discipline was a kind of quality that was applied to work rather than something with a pension plan, right? Um, and, you know, I mean, when we talk about interdisciplinarity in the academy, you know that you're in the grip of disciplinarity when you hear that word, right? I mean, it's like the last vestige of it's a, the disciplinarity holding on with its dying grip, you know? Um, and, and so, you know, it's, it's, it, it's, it's a problematic cluster of uh, a semantic cluster, interdisciplinarity, and the words that attend that word, um, uh, and, and, and challenging to kind of get beyond some of our thinking about what it means to be interdisciplinary um, that leads us back into disciplines again and again and again. So a lot of the stuff that we try to do in MetaLab involves using technology to, to disrupt some of those patterns, um, to disrupt some of the discourse. Um, uh, and of course, Charles uh, Wilson Peel, um, I think it's telling that his museum uh, well, you know, it was a museum of arts and sciences. I mean, he was a, 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 a major natural historian as well as a painter. Uh, and um, it's interesting to me that his museum collection ended up uh, not going to another kind of institution of higher learning or, uh, or a, a, a kind of philanthropic uh, institution, but it went to P.T. Barnum. Um, it uh, became part of a kind of 19th century industry of edutainment, and uh, 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 that those energies um, were largely what I, I think a lot of the museums of the late 19th century, uh, the kind of philanthropic institutions um, that are now sort of our, our kind of capital museums and, and, and libraries and other institutions, the Met, the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston, um, as well as the New York Public Library for that matter, the Boston Public Library. They were in some ways reactions against that edutainment, against the Dime Museum, um, an attempt to, to uh, bring the public back into uh, dialogue with, um, you know, with uh, the, the, the good, the true, and the beautiful, um, you know, out of which we end up with this kind of siloed approach, I think. In part, we end up with this siloed approach because of the need to kind of, the felt need to discipline um, the, the, not only um, the teaching and, and learning, uh, but the, the kind of broad public engagement with the production of knowledge, with images, with collections. Um, I just put up a map of, of, of uh, part of Harvard Yard to you know, illustrate how siloed this is with, with museums within museums within museums um, and, and you know, the Widener Library and, and Houghton Library down here, um, which are you know, libraries, but also museums in an important way just as the museums are libraries and archives in important ways. And yet, it's curious how often these collections, by virtue of this disciplinarity, um, end up not being able to speak to each other, um, even in these close physical spaces. Um, uh, and, and not only are they not able to speak to each other, but the ways in which we experience these collections change by virtue of our kind of implicit understandings, our norms and values that we bring to the experience of going to a library versus going to a museum. And some of the projects that we've undertaken are attempts to use um, different kinds of technological affordances to get these collections talking to each other. Um, and I'll, I'll show some of that shortly. Um, in fact, one uh, such project, so we, um, beyond joking about being a Neolithic band, we are a, a kind of um, hybrid group of, of people. I, I write um, largely about the um, cultural history of collections and cultural history of expressive technologies, the history of the book in particular. Uh, but my colleagues include um, uh, an Italianist uh, whose specialty is, is Dante, um, a, 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 an interaction, uh, computer uh, interaction uh, designer and scholar of um, uh, the study of technology and society. Uh, we are uh, headquartered um, administratively in the Berkman Center for Internet and Society at Harvard, which, is, uh, which has its roots in the law school. Um, and our students come from the Graduate School of Design, where we have strong affiliations, as well as the Faculty of Arts and Sciences and other, um, uh, other faculties across the campus. Um, this uh, is, is um, a painting, a drawing, actually, that is uh, by Edward Lear. Um, and it's part of a collection 
uh, that's housed at Houghton Library of Lear's Landscape Drawings and Paintings. Um, Lear is, of course, best known today as a caricaturist and a, uh, and a, a creator of nonsense verse, but he was a journeyman landscape painter um, and, and natural history painter and, and landscape painter who you know, spent most of his um, uh, uh, career, his, his, um, his working life, uh, traveling the continent, making paintings, making paintings for sale. And so Houghton Library ends up with this collection of 3,500 paintings and drawings um, from Lear, uh, uh, which, which he amassed over this, this career. Most of them sort of studies for uh, later works that would, that would be sold. Um, and it, it's, it's interesting that it gets treated as, as an archive, as a manuscript, a set of manuscripts, rather than as a set of paintings. Um, it's been curated wonderfully, um, but it's been curated with this particular paradigm. Um, and, and, uh, and so it gets uh, a finding aid, you know, which is a, a kind of standard practice in the archival world. These began as text documents, and now they're typically made um, in, uh, 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 in, in digital form. Uh, this is how a part of the, uh, the very large, very rich finding aid for, for Lear's collection uh, looks in Oasis, which is a, a, a piece of, the, uh, of Harvard's library information system uh, that allows one to look at, at, uh, at, uh, at textual finding aids. Um, now, Anne asked about how many of you have taken a class in ethics. I want to ask how many of you know XML? Okay. How many of you heard of XML? Okay. Interesting. Okay. Good, good, good. Um, I'm not going to teach you XML. Um, <laughs> Uh, but uh, there's XML behind this, and, and, and that plays into the story of this uh, student project in an interesting way. So we have um, a program that we call the Curatorial Innovation Fellowship, uh, which we uh, partnered with the Graduate School of Design and Faculty of Arts and Sciences to get just a little bit of money to offer small stipends to graduate students. Uh, to give them a year, we, we asked them to pitch um, uh, uh, sort of innovative projects that would infuse technology into a kind of curatorial engagement with a collection. We gathered a group of curators from libraries and museums across campus, and the students um, pitched these curators, not us. Um, and, and so we partnered them up, essentially, with collections um, across campus. And the year involved their dialogue with um, collections professionals in different contexts uh, uh, to refine their idea uh, to explore alternative modes for bringing that idea to fruition and uh, for um, getting together regularly to share their various experiences of different kinds of collections, different institutions, of, different kind of uh, cultures of collecting around campus and reflect on curatorial practice, collection, connoisseurship, um, and its embodiment in cultural history. Um, so over the course of the year, um, uh, last year, we had um, eight projects come to fruition. And this was one of them um, made by Travis Bost, who was studying um, to be an architect. Um, and Travis was very interested in Lear's uh, drawing collection. And his initial idea was to map it in some way, because these collections, it's the landscape uh, art, 3,500 um, uh, works that um, in, you know, embody place in a very kind of rich and evocative way. Um, uh, and, but he, we kept going back to the finding aid. The finding aid is full of information, and uh, it's full of information about the places where those paintings and drawings were made, um, but it didn't feel, it, it, you know, it, Travis was worried about trying to visualize this, trying to map it, and having to sort of scrape all of that information from this textual finding aid. Well, behind this finding aid is XML. Now, it looks like this, you know, it's rather alienating and forbidding, but What's you know magical about a markup language is that it's it's programmatically accessible. Um, it's it's harder for us to read, but it's very easy for a, a computer to read. And you teach that computer what you want it to, to to read, and it can do wonderful things for you. It can help you to surface patterns in the the finding aid that are implicit here, in terms of you know where Lear went, where he was interested in making paintings and drawings, um, which places he returned to, what kinds of media he was using, and what that might tell you about. Uh, about the, the market for art materials, um, uh, the practices of, of journeyman artists like Lear. Um, there are all kinds of stories that can be told here. Um, and and they're, they're, they're there to be teased out. It's not that you can't do this without uh, a particular kind of technology. Um, but uh, technology allows you to um, express some of these patterns in, in kind of uniquely rich ways. So what Travis ended up making was a series of visualizations of this metadata. Now, 
uh, I should say that one thing that's, that, that struck us kind of in retrospect um, is that this stuff is not immediately accessible from here. Um, that what, what, what is lacking here, and it's typically lacking in these library information systems, is a button that says, give me the data. You know? And in fact, if you, you, know, if you know a little bit about browsers and you, and you click on view source to look at the code behind this page, you find that the, um, the system has kind of stripped out all the XML and replaced it with HTML, which just tells you how to style the page. It just says headers, italics, uh, uh, um, indent, uh, cell padding, these sorts of things. It doesn't tell you what kind of information is here. It's not semantic in the way that this XML is. You know, you see, and this is not XML from this finding aid. This is from Harvard University Art Museum data, in fact. Um, but you see that these, you know, XML tags tell you about the information. Um, and, you know, it's important to realize, and it was important for Travis to realize, that this is a cultural object. This is an interpretation of these data. This is not dropping fully formed from the brow of, of Zeus or, um, or IBM, for that matter. Um, uh, these are cultural objects that deserve um, interpretation and close reading uh, the same way literary texts do. That's a bit of an aside. Uh, but what we had to do is go to the archivists in Houghton Library and ask them if they could get this file for us, the XML for the, um, uh, for the archival finding aid, uh, once we had that in hand, um, we, uh, Travis could begin to make this visualization using processing, which is a, 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 a programming language, a so-called high-level programming language, which, which means it's, it's relatively easy for mortals to learn. Um, uh, and, and it's relatively intuitive. And it was designed specifically to give artists, designers, um, uh, uh, an opportunity to, to use programming in, in their practices. So um, uh, what Travis did with these XML data was very interesting. Um, uh, he created this series of visualizations. This is one of them, and this is not live. This is a screenshot uh, because I've, I've learned since be becoming involved with technology never to do like live demos. They just, you know, they, 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 I, I have enough trouble as it is. Um, but uh, this is one image of one of the visualizations. What you see here are, uh, you know, across, across the, this horizontal axis, um, places where Lear worked. The, the vertical bars represent the number of paintings produced. And the interesting piece, um, the interesting kind of pattern here is um, uh, Travis added uh, these concentric circles which represent the total surface area of all the paintings done in a particular location. Um, now, this is a very difficult thing to get from a textual finding aid, you know? And maybe it's not valuable, but I, there's an interesting kind of a dynamic that's being expressed here, potentially, you know? You can look and see, um, you know, in locations where Lear did a lot of painting, um, was he painting it, you know, in, in relatively small formats or large ones, you know? And you do find, if you run this um, interactively, that there are places where very few paintings were done, but but the surface area of them in aggregate is quite large. He was working in a larger format at that time. So you begin to see these patterns that are, that are hard to see, um, just consuming the textual information, as it were. Um, uh, he, you know, he did a lot with chronology and expressing digital images of the paintings. The most interesting um, to me, the most compelling of these visualizations was this one where um, at Travis created this grid and each of these squares in the grid represents one of the works. Um, and so there are 3,500 um, squares here. And along the bottom, uh, there are buttons that let you select uh, uh, to visualize certain characteristics. Um, you know, the, the, uh, the location, the size, the, the paper, uh, the medium, and, and notes um, that uh, uh, the archival uh, finding aid is particularly rich in notes that Lear took for his own use, uh, where he would tell himself what what, what um, tints he wanted to use in the finished work or what, what, the, um, what the conditions were like at the time. So there's a lot of this free text material in, in, the, uh, in the finding aid um, that tells you things about um, you know, Lear's practice and his experience of being a painter. So you can uh, select these different, um, these different fields, these different qualities, uh, and see patterns emerge in, uh, in Lear's practice. You can find, and these, the, the different um, shadings of, of uh, uh, boxes up here. So right now we have um, date uh, selected and you're looking at a particular uh, work and you're seeing the, the black shaded squares are um, those that were done 
the same week um, as this painting. The darker gray are done in the same month and the lighter gray are done in the same year. So with this kind of functionality, you can really begin to see changes in um, uh, you know, how prolific Lear was, um, how active he was, um, and see those patterns change at different time scales. Um, you see them change uh, uh, in terms of the media that he used or, the, or the, even the colors of the paper. I mean, this was just a very interesting artifact of the finding aid that, that it noted the color of the paper and, and Travis thought what, that was compelling, so he wondered, well, what, what, what does it look like? What, what choices of paper color is, is Lear uh, working with over time? And, and so you see that expressed here as well. Um, so, uh, this is just what, uh, what, what data ca can look like um, when they're removed from kind of institutional contexts. Um, and this is the kind of thing we, we want to get a hold of. This is the kind of thing we, we get excited about, um, metadata. Uh, and and uh, 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 this is a, a kind of metadata called JSON, which makes it able to talk to JavaScript, which is a, another high-level programming language that talks to the web very easily. Um, this was extracted from the Harvard University Art Museums. Um, so this, no, this is actually from the Digital Public Library of America. Um, uh, and, and so this, this is, uh, for me, a, a key to my, uh, my pitch and my, my hope that we can have this kind of accessibility to collections data, metadata in collections in different institutional contexts, and bring these data together to let students like Travis do the kind of thing that he that he did uh, with the Lear paintings. Um, but metadata isn't, isn't the whole story with our projects. So I'll, I'll, I'll show this. Um, how much how am I doing on time? Yeah, OK. Um, so here's another project that we've been working on uh, that we've called Teaching with Things. And this also is, is um, uh, a, a project that has a lot of student involvement. Uh, it's, it's funded by um, an interfaculty initiative at Harvard called the Harvard Institute for Learning and Teaching uh, that gave seed grants for infusing technology into different kinds of teaching um, environments. And, and it was a project we called Teaching with Things, which seems entirely germane in this context. Uh, and what we were basically trying to do was get objects in collections um, working as kind of interfaces to the information about those objects. Um, what you see here is, and I'm going to play this video shortly, um, but behind the start button um, is a 3D scan of an ostracon. Now an ostracon is, and many of you will know this, um, a particular writing medium uh, from the ancient world um, used throughout antiquity, um, uh, fragments of, uh, of pottery um, on which people wrote. And this was kind of uh, the, the post-it note of the ancient world in many ways. Uh, there weren't many post-it notes around, but there were a lot of shards of pottery around. And so people used them to write on. And, and they tend to be well preserved um, in garbage middens and this sort of thing throughout the Near East. And uh, they tell us a lot about the social history of the ancient world. I mean, people wrote receipts on these. They wrote magical spells on these. They wrote um, promises to people. The, the word ostracon, because they also use them in voting, um, uh, particularly in Athens, it's, it's the root of our word ostracism, because it's how you, uh, it's how you, it's how you uh, decided whether or not to exile somebody. So ostraca are, 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 are very important objects in understanding the social history of the ancient world, but they're one of these hybrid objects. Are they archaeological artifacts? Are they um, art artifacts? Are they written texts? The answer, obviously, is yes. But we have ostraca that end up in libraries. We have ostraca that end up in archives. And we have ostraca that end up in museums. And they're handled and curated differently and, and have a hard time talking to each other. Um, so we're interested in a, kind of creating a hybrid space where you know, if they're in a library, we, teach, we treat them as a text. And you see transcriptions of these in the scholarly literature that are kind of reduced. The materiality of the object is reduced. You don't know anything from that transcription about, um, about the, the kind of pottery um, that was being made in the region. Um, uh, there are unique affordances to the materiality of these objects that we, that we want to get at. Now, obviously, m objects like this can't just be handled in a classroom environment. So uh, we had students making scans of these ostraca, uh, 3D scans using free software that you can actually load onto your iPad. Um, and, and so they were interacting with the object in a controlled environment. And then taking that, um, taking that 3D scan and 
um, using it as an interface. And what you see here in this kind of frenetic video is uh, a system that a student designed for annotating the 3D object. Now, 3D software is used a lot in architecture and, and industrial engineering, um, you know, and they have much different needs than, um, we, than we do, right? I mean, uh, a 3D file needs to be able to let you model things like airflow and, and, and stress effects on, on, on an object. And we're using it um, to annotate different aspects of that material object. Um, and this is a, a, a system that the student designed that would take a 3D object, um, uh, put it on, on a, a web page um, so that it could be interacted with publicly, and then give you a little tool to annotate um, that object and share those annotations with others. Um, it was part of a, a, an attempt to make a kind of syllabus of things um, to treat these uh, objects for the purpose of, of teaching um, as, as one teaches texts in, uh, or, or treats texts in a traditional syllabus. Um, I'm out of my, let me go back to my presentation. Um, just a few other projects. Now, this is not a project of ours, actually. And uh, William, you might recognize some of this. This is, a, um, this is an object in the Met, um, uh, the, the queen of the French, a bust. But this is not the actual object, or it's an actual object, but it's not the object in the collection. It's a 3D printed version of that. Um, uh, here's the collection record. Um, and, uh, and it was created uh, by a group of people who, who were invited into the Met um, uh, associated with MakerBot, which is a, a kind of open source um, manufacturer of 3D printing tools and software. Uh, they've gotten a lot of buzz in tech culture. And a group of them came to the Met um, last year, I think it was, and had a kind of scanning workshop where they toured the galleries with curators, looked for likely objects, scanned them, and printed them in 3D. And I think this is a wonderful engagement uh, of, of a, a, a kind of distinctive community um, interacting with curators and education personnel at the Met. Um, I think there's an exchange of, of information and ideas and work practices and values that takes place in this kind of encounter um, that's, that's really um, inspiring to me. We've had similar experiences ourselves in a, a long engagement that Metal Lab has undertaken with the Arnold Arboretum, um, which is uh, a, a, a teaching collection at Harvard. It's a, a kind of unique arboretum are, are, are interesting because they're collections, of course, but they're collections of living things. Um, and they're collections that are disposed uh, uh, in, in large spaces. They're landscapes. They're, um, they, they, they work at an aesthetic level. Uh, they, they work as uh, collections of, of plant material. There's a, taxon a taxonomic uh, botanical layer of the production of knowledge involved with the Arboretum. And of course, it's a good place to walk your dog, too. Um, so it's a very hybrid space. And, and, and yet, when people interact with a place like the Arboretum, they typically interact with one of those affordances to the exclusion of the other ones. Um, uh, and, and so we worked with a group, uh, a, a place in, in Central Square in Cambridge called Nuvu Studio, uh, which is um, a, a group that is a kind of education startup that's offering studio experiences in technology and making for high school students. And we did um, two back-to-back two-week studios in the Arboretum. So we took the students um, to the Arboretum. Here you see them talking to um, the curator of living collections at the Arboretum, who's introducing the students to some of the tools that they use in the field to collect information about the collection, to curate the collection. Um, the students learned a lot about the collection. They, they um, put sensors in the environment and, and uh, 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 to track uh, environmental phenomena, and then they thought about ways to express that, um, those information in, in novel ways. And David, when you were talking about um, eye tracking and, and uh, sort of giving the students the tools and, and letting them discover what they will with those tools, I was very much reminded of this project because this is really how we proceeded. I mean, the students came to grips with the Arboretum sort of on their own terms with the technology that they were familiar with. Um, and they began to see patterns and find ways of expressing them that, that connected with these various domains and connected these various domains of knowledge production and experience um, that are sort of native to the Arboretum environment. Um, one of the projects they made, which this, this may be hard to see here, this looks like a 
some kind of strange uh, phosphorescent um, sea creature, but it's it's a robo flower that the students devised, um, and it's a it's sort it's it's meant to open and close like a flower does. It's actually connected to a computer, um, and it's got these um, LED lights that run through it. It's a beautifully expressive object, uh, beautifully designed object. They went through several prototypes to get to this version, and crucially, it's connected to a computer so that it can express these data. It can, it, it opens and closes and changes its lighting characteristics dependent on temperature and humidity and soil moisture in the arboretum. So these were attempts um, by the students to bring these domains together in, in rich and interesting ways. Um, so I want to close with reflecting on what kinds of spaces um, promote this kind of experience, what kind of spaces um, uh, 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 allow this kind of encounter. Uh, because I think, you know, I've talked a lot about XML and JSON and other kind of data formats and programmatic accessibility and APIs. There's a lot of this that seems disembodied. Um, but these are material objects. They're objects of material culture. And they are sites of encounter for um, diverse uh, kinds of practices and, and domains of experience. Um, so, you know, it's one thing to infuse spaces with technology in different ways, to have kind of, you know, um, touch screen walls and, and interactive surfaces, uh, to have interesting sound installations. Uh, but we also want these spaces to foster this kind of, um, this kind of collaborative dialogue where we get designers and scholars and students together and see what they can discover about their various ways of knowing, their various ways of experiencing the world. You know, Robert Irwin, the artist, talks about uh, the dialogue of imminence um, with reference to his experiences working with astrophysics, uh, astrophysicists uh, in, uh, in, 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 with NASA in the 60s. Um, uh, this experience of interdisciplinarity that's not interdisciplinarity. You know, when we typically talk about interdisciplinarity, we talk about our disciplinarity and we never really get to the interdisciplinary part. Uh, but if you get together and make something um, with people with widely different kinds of practices and understandings of the world, um, you quickly get to this thing that Robert Irwin called the dialogue of imminence, where the, the kind of implicit norms and values that we, that we share um, get surfaced in the practice of that um, collaboration. So the spaces that I'm excited about are spaces where uh, uh, people from lots of different communities can come together and make things together without knowing what the, the outcome will be at the end. And I think it's important, reflecting on Anne's discussion of ethics, this is where ethics comes in because um, many students are going to be leaving and, and, and uh, college and entering careers in which technology is, um, a, is a major part of their experience. They're making technology or they're using technology. Um, and the values and norms that are arising in technology, well, they come mostly from the business world, from startup culture, from Silicon Valley. There's a very particular cultural cluster of norms and values that's being expressed in technology. But it doesn't have to be that way. It doesn't have to be that way. Um, and so, you know, there are benefits to the ways in which we experience art, letters, and culture. But there are also benefits to the kind of technology that we can look forward to experiencing in the future. Um, by getting these, these values, close reading, close looking, uh, critical attention, um, and the open-ended discourse that design thinking constitutes, infusing technology with that, as well as infusing our arts and letters with technology, is what kind of excites us at Metal Lab, and I, and I hope it um, intrigues you as well. Thank you. All right, um, good morning everyone, and um, thank you Juliet, and thank you to the presenters on the panel. It's been such a pleasure to hear from everyone this morning. Um, as the respondent for this panel, I've been furiously jotting down notes and sketching out connections among these topics, and of course thinking about how we can apply this knowledge to our museum practice. Um, museum educators in the room will be able to identify with this situation of trying to stay in the moment of the conversation with our visitors and being responsive to that as the conversation unfolds. So I will do my best to pull together some thoughts and some questions that I jotted down um, in response to our panelists. And I look forward to all of you interacting through the question and answer period and the breakout sessions very shortly. Um, please bear with me if some of my thoughts don't come across in the most clearly organized 
way, um, given the spontaneous nature of my role today. Um, just to very briefly reintroduce myself, um, I wear a variety of hats in my career and in my academic life, and I think thus the rationale behind inviting me today to be a respondent. Um, my day job is to oversee K-12 school and teacher programs at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Um, I'm also an adjunct professor of museum studies at NYU. Um, also at NYU, my partner Philip Kane and I, Philip's here in the back of the room, are both uh, faculty fellows in residence, which means that we create and implement informal learning opportunities for about 970 NYU sophomores at Gramercy Green Residence Hall, where we live among them. Um, and at last, I should mention I'm a student myself um, in cognitive studies, and so for the past few years, I've been doing some deep thinking about thinking, um, especially in terms of what that looks like in the museum. So to start, since I primarily self-identify as a museum educator myself, a big question that has been examined today is really how we define and examine the audiences that we serve as we strive to create the ideal learning environment. Um, as Juliet asked at the beginning, who benefits from the ideal learning environment that we're striving to create and what are their interests and values? Um, well, we all know that we need to look closely at our museum audiences beyond simple demographics. What are their motivations for coming to the museum? What kinds of questions are they bringing to the museum? Um, are they coming in support of some specific goal or class? Or maybe they're just hanging out or decompressing. Uh, and as someone with a fine arts background myself, it's really all too easy to slip back into my own framework or lens of viewing the museum of art or aesthetics. And I need to remind myself of the infinite number of entry points that museum visitors bring. Um, actually, as Kenji was describing, I think so well with your diagram, people are entering that circle or that ecosystem from so many different um, entry points that we need to be responsive to that. Um, but then as Anya pointed out too, how can we really consider all aspects of students, even aspects such as moral education and their values? Can we look at historical and contemporary examples in order to inform our museum practice, whether that's ranging from Plato and Aristotle to more contemporary examples? And a phrase that Anya used, I thought it particularly stuck with me, is this question of, well, what does it mean to be human? And how can museums really facilitate that in some way? I think Neil Postman wrote an article years ago called Museums as Dialogue, where he talked about the role of, of museums as essentially being mirrors for humans to think about this question. Um, and while many core values maybe do not shift so radically from one generation to the next, we need to be responsive to some of the differences between generations, whether it's within a family unit and how they are relating to one another, um, or whether it's um, how people are responding to the aesthetics and the images around them and how that shapes their knowledge. Um, one aspect, too, of Anya's uh, comments around comfort with creativity or maybe discomfort with creativity. Since yesterday afternoon, we were talking quite a bit about 21st century learning skills, creativity being one of them. And it made me wonder if our expectations in museums around open-endedness and creativity are aligned with millennials, with current college students, and if not, how can museums provide better scaffolding and support to foster um, creativity and even comfort with ambiguity? Um, and as we think about undergraduate students, I think about my own experience living in the dorm, uh, or the residence hall as we typically call it, and you know, students are often trying out new things, they are experimenting, they're sampling and remixing things as they form opinions and arguments. And of course, um, that's is exactly what we want college students to do. Um, maybe in some ways Anya might disagree with this point in terms of whether things are similar or whether they're different among generations. But one thing that I notice among students that might be different from Generation X, uh, which is my own generation, is that students do expect today, I think, a lot of flexibility in their choices and in their time. 
Uh, they're able to plan in different ways and communicate in different ways. Um, and they have all kinds of communication tools at their disposal that help them um, think about these different options. Although, as Kenji said, um, Dartmouth students have no time. So then how they make decisions around that time is certainly a big factor. Um, thinking more about um, Kenji's work with the um, Museum Collecting 101 course, I was really struck by how, as museums, we can really co-construct exemplary learning opportunities um, where students are really immersed in supporting their ideas uh, with evidence, how they're actively making choices, um, and they're very well-considered choices, too. And then how do these learning communities affect or propel forward other kinds of learning communities? How can that kind of critical thinking that they're generating in a collaborative environment impact others in different ways? So a question that I have for museums going forward is, how can they better see, analyze, and understand their visitors, not only through traditional models of gathering demographics, but looking closely at motivations, at beliefs and values, and attitudes, and then apply that knowledge to museum practice. So now that we've looked a little bit at who is this museum audience, how do we define them, the key question for the panel this morning is, well, how do we create an ideal learning environment in the museum. And I think first, in order to tackle that question, we should look at how is our understanding of thinking and of learning evolved? Um, how can museums apply this knowledge about thinking and learning to creating this new environment? Um, as a doctoral student in cognitive science, I'm often revisiting this question of how we think and how we learn, how knowledge about the human brain informs those um, types of approaches. And one distinction that came to mind as I was listening to the panelists is one of brain versus mind. Um, when I was a first year doctoral student and I was immersed in um, information processing systems and post-World War II computer science models being used as metaphors for the brain, and I was having a conversation with my advisor about, well, as someone who works in an art museum setting, what does all of this mean for me? And she said, you really need to shift your thinking from brain to mind. And what she meant was that there's many ways of thinking and knowing that happen outside of the brain, um, moving beyond information processing. And I think a lot of the examples that we heard this morning really provide evidence for that. We learn through our bodies, through our environment, through objects, through one another. Um, in the field of cognition, this is often called situated or embodied cognition. Uh, and so as we observe and interact and share with one another, um, we're essentially in a type of networked environment, whether that uses technology or not. Um, and sometimes even thinking about the distribution of thinking or distributed cognition, um, one of the leading thinkers of that, actually being a scientist who did a lot of work on Navy vessels, on Air Force car uh, carriers, and looked at how Navy teams, um, how they made decisions in a collaborative way and how the result of those decisions was better informed as a group than as individuals. But on this topic of networked thinking, um, David, I think, really reminded us so well that we are hardwired to be social, collaborative creatures. Um, as museum professionals, I think we also need to think about nonverbal ways of sharing and collaborating and interacting. It makes me wonder how current research, as we just learned about the Obama administration's brain research project or um, fMRI studies or mirror neuron studies can also help museum visitors think about how they're interacting with one another beyond talking. Um, some other things that we looked at and I think came out through the examples that David shared is how through this networked kind of thinking, how is the whole greater than the sum of its parts? Um, what, hap what has happened when a class of students solves an issue in spherical trigonometry that individual scientists or mathematicians could not solve for 200 years? I think that warrants a lot of close examination. And how can museums, um, institutions that are often trying to foster deep focus and sustained engagement, how can we better see some of those opportunities? Um, Kenji raised an important point too around shared ownership that results from that deep engagement and that network thinking? And how can that shared ownership then propel others to do the same? 
And then a final broad thought, of course, is as we embark on major building campaigns, or maybe not so major, maybe it's just thinking about um, environments that we have more immediate control over, how does the physical environment shape our thinking? Um, certainly, we learned from David's example of the founding um, and the evolving nature of Quest, built from scratch. What is it like to argue for a week about the kinds of tables that are going to be used in order to facilitate learning? I think it's certainly evidence of time well spent as we move from a 20th century model where learners are seen as active, but environments are primarily passive, to a 21st century learning environment where um, there are essentially places where learners can be engaged in both self-directed activities, but also collaborative learning activities that the physical environment also informs, um, where these places can be routinely reorganized quickly and efficiently to support learning. Um, it makes me think of the post-World War II Reggio Emilia approach in Italy, where the environment is essentially thought of as a third teacher. Um, among students and the facilitator or the educator. So happily, um, I think museum staff and museum educators in particular are really well positioned to be leaders in this um, realm of situated or embodied or distributed cognition. We already see that visitors are active participants in meaning making. We see that time and again in our own experiences. We look at studies that were recently released, like the Irvine Foundation's Getting In on the Act that looks at expectations among visitors that want to be cultural participants and not just recipients. Um, so how can we use these more hands-on, creative, dialogic ways of engaging visitors? So a question that I might pose is, just like the fields of cognitive science that have moved beyond a strict information processing model, how can we move into more of a multiplicity of lenses and modes? And how might museums, in particular those that are working on campus environments, how can they experiment with new ways of knowing, thinking about all of these different factors? So to conclude, before we move into questions, so what are some of the next big steps for museums given um, what we've heard from our panelists today as we think about creating the ideal learning environment. Well, one question that I have is information and communication, as it's more readily shared and created and distributed or even visualized, as we saw from Matthew's presentation, what kinds of shifts can we anticipate in the museum or in the university as a whole? Um, and how can museums move from being simply responsive to these larger shifts in the culture to really being leaders and innovators in those shifts? Um, some of you might have seen last Saturday, there was a piece in the New York Times from David Brooks around the practical university, and he posited that with the explosion of online courses and the efficiency of delivering information, what he calls technical information, universities are now charged with thinking more deeply about practical information, meaning the application, uh, the practice, the experiential learning. And so I would say that museums find themselves in that same kind of quandary. And then another question that I might uh, pose, and I think it came up yesterday quite a bit, certainly in our conversation, um, and as we learned today about courses like musical mathematics that have components of this, is this question of interdisciplinarity. How can museums and universities realize a more interdisciplinary approach as we work towards creating the ideal learning environment? And how can the languages of science and research and technology be authentically merged with those who work in other areas and vice versa? Um, I was really struck with Matthew's comment around um, how can we authentically get to that around disrupting some of those disciplines in their traditional formats? So um, clearly, all of these questions do not have simple answers, they have many answers, um, and maybe since um, Anya inspired us with some references to John Dewey, I'll conclude this part of the panel with another reference to John Dewey, who reminds us that um, we do not learn from experience, but we learn from reflecting on experience. And so as we embark on doing that, I look forward to our conversations later this afternoon. Thank you. Thank you very much to our panelists and William, thank you.
Uh, since dialogue is at the center of what we've been talking about today, uh, we want to spend some time in dialogue with you. Uh, taking your questions, there is a microphone available if you raise your hand to ask a question. Uh, we have about 10 or 15 minutes to do that, and then we'll continue this same dialogue in our smaller breakout groups uh, until lunchtime. The questions for our panelists. Hi, I, I really enjoyed the panel. Um, I'm Kathy Klimaszewski, I'm from the Johnson Museum of Art at Cornell. And just in response to William, I think one of the things that ex has excited me the most in recent, past year probably, in our museum, is this um, excitement for the museum as a place of risk taking and new experiences. And the faculty and the students are looking at us in a new way. And so this is a, a, a new kind of, it's not new, but it's new for us to look at and think about um, ways that we can engage, for instance, the creation of new work. How can the collection and how can the exhibitions spark the creation of new work in music, for instance? So we work with this incredible music group that comes in and responds to the collection and the shows and, and gives the visitors a chance to create deeper meaning in, in whole new areas, or, or poets or writers, and how they can be inspired by what the museum is doing, or how the spaces themselves in the museum can inspire this. So I'm really interested in hearing what other people might be doing in their museums regarding this. Um, uh, thank you. I would just add to that that um, in a conversation yesterday afternoon in our breakout session, I thought it was so well put that um, we discussed how can museum staff members better reflect the risks and the innovations that are so often represented in the works of art in our collections? How can we really embody that? And so I think your question and your comment really reflects that. Hi, so I just had a question about um, like kind of based on the curatorial innovation internship that Matthew was talking about, but kind of expanding it broader. So, you know, how do we push students to, to think innovatively and like push themselves to use technology who are not in these like departments that are so traditionally like attached to technology? So like, I think we, you know, as a millennial, like we're programmed to think that, you know, kind of innovation can only happen or not only happen, but like it traditionally happens in like engineering, architecture, design, et cetera. Like I feel like, you know, sometimes I'm an econ student, I'm an art history student, so you know, it feels like there isn't really a lot of room to integrate that unless you're using technology on a daily basis. So how do you, you know, kind of push these students to not be afraid of like integrating into their like curriculum, but also like to use it, you know, to kind of like take that risk and you know, participate in a project like that. Because I think, you know, as someone who's interested in what you were talking about, but because I don't have that background, I would like not even, you know, not even take that risk to like try that project. So how do you do that with students? Yeah, it's a great question and it's a huge challenge. I mean, it's a challenge we come across in practical terms um, day in and day out. Um, uh, it's, it, it, you know, technology is forbidding. It's forbidding for, for students, even students who are digital natives. And it's certainly tech, and it certainly um, can be devastatingly forbidding uh, for the, uh, the culture at large. Um, you know, and there's no easy answer, although, you know, one thing that's occurring to me as I was kind of meditating on um, Kenji's phrase of the, the, uh, the ecology of ownership, um, which I think is a wonderfully evocative phrase, and I think it's a, it's a real kind of provocation to, to, to try and instigate um, uh, a sense of ownership um, of collections, of technologies, and I think particularly of the public library movement, um, where I think that ecology of ownership arose um, in very particular and very interesting ways in the early 20th century in the United States. Um, and you know, if you read uh, writers in that time period, um, particularly writers who are, um, you know, who came from or whose parents came from Southern Europe or from the Pale of Settlement, um, uh, who, first generation immigrants to the United States, they were uh, bowled over um, by the sense of ownership that they could participate in in the public libraries, in the great metropolitan public libraries in particular, that they could go into these places, these, these neoclassical spaces first and foremost, 
uh, but that they could go into these places and use anything that they found there. Uh, Mary Anton was a writer who talked about how, you know, this, how striking it was going to the Boston Public Library that this place was hers. You know, this was her way of articulating this. Alfred Kazin, too, uh, working on his first book in the, in the reading room at the New York Public Library had this kind of overwhelming sense of ownership. And it's a very different thing with um, very similarly public-spirited institutions um, like our, our public museums. I don't think that people feel that sense of ownership of those collections in the same way they do in libraries. And a lot of that has to do with the material. I mean, you, you just can't lend out the art, right? You can't let people wander around with it. Um, and you know, technology, interestingly, I think, gives us some flexibility for experiencing these collections. But it also, I mean, it comes with perils uh, because you know, these are you know, the technologies are cultural objects as well, and we bake our values into them um, implicitly or explicitly. And too often, technology is a conduit for consumer experience for consumption. And so it's all too easy to create these experiences with technology that are consumer experiences, essentially, that you go and you stand in front of something and, you know, this kind of conduit theory um, that, you know, you, you know that, that knowledge gets, gets imparted into the empty vessel. Um, it's interesting to think about ways in which we can use technology to cultivate that ecology of ownership, to create experiences of objects and collections that people can, can manipulate. Um, that doesn't directly answer this question of, of getting into the technology itself, except to say that the kind of hopeful note that I ended with um, about technology and the making of technology being infused with liberal values or you know, the, the values of the liberal arts has a real practical output when you see technologies like Arduino, which is a physical computing system that you can play with that's really easy to begin to play with, or processing, the language that I described, which, you know, there's a learning curve, but it's not the same kind of learning curve that you have with like Fortran, Fortran or, or Objective-C. So there are, you know, increasingly as technologists are excited um, to see their work used in these creative ways, uh, they, they, you know, they co-create with us tools that allow us to get into and manipulate these technologies in new ways. I'd just like to add on to that a little bit in terms of the question of how to get people who might not be, you know, consider themselves tech savvy to become involved in uh, projects of prior technology. In that, um, I think I'm, I'm speaking for personal experience, but when I started work at Attire Archives, it was still not even registered as nonprofit. And our, our first project was really to get you know, a database up and running and to show that we, we have the infrastructure, infrastructure to do something to get the funding for that. And it was me and three other interns who were all kind of art history humanities people. But we came together and we had to learn XML and SQL by ourselves. And if I were to go to computer science class that teaches that, um, the kinds of things I learned through that project are probably very different from how it's being taught in class. And I probably will fail one of those exams. But <laughs> you know, just working through the project and, and just having that basic literacy of understanding you know, what, how do databases work in, at a very fundamental level, what, what is XML compared to other markup languages. And you know, I feel that we just need to be conversant in, in these kinds of things in order to push the project forward. Because when the time came, to actually create a real database, we, we hired somebody externally to, to come in and help us with that. But after going through that initial process of learning it ourselves, we could talk to them and, and articulate you know, the demands that we wanted for, um, to, to the database designers from you know, our you know, limited understanding, but still there was that common dialogue that could be created. So in some ways, I feel that, you know, the project-based you know, learning that I think both David and Matthew were talking about is a very important tool of facilitating you know, kind of very practical learning experiences, but also the fact that not all of us have to be programmers. We just need to be able to talk to programmers. Uh, hello, I'm David Odo from the Yale University Art Gallery, and I have a question for David Helfand. Um, I was wondering if thus far at Quest, if you've had any, your students have had any direct um, relationship with museums, and if not, how would you imagine uh, of, you know, classes set in the museum setting using museum collections? So not just objects per se or art making, but if they've had any interaction with museums. 
And if not, how would you imagine that to take place? I'm afraid the interaction has been depressingly traditional in that they you know, get on a bus and go to the Vancouver Art Museum and walk around with a faculty member looking at things in a very uh, 19th century way. We have the opportunity for students on campus to create art and I think that's been more successful and mostly has been student driven uh, rather so we give them a space and say, okay, here's a space, do what you want to with it, and then let them create life drawing classes and you know, want to do stuff with the, we're, we're in a, a sort of spectacular natural setting, figure out what to do with the outdoors as, as creative. We also encourage people to be very creative in their classes. So for example, I teach a class which is called How to Build a Habitable Planet. It's a, it's a introductory class that everybody has to take. It's an Earth, Ocean, Space. And uh, the final assignment is that each group of four students gets a different star that's different in all of its properties from the sun. And from what they've learned in the class, they have to create a solar system. And in addition to creating the solar system in which one planet is habitable, they have to create the culture of that planet, the art of that planet. They have to do a, a presentation on this, which can range to highly creative, I have to say. <laughs> I won't give you the details, but, uh, and uh, as a consequence, we, we, we encourage them to constantly integrate all the creative talents they have into a class, even though it's a physics class. Uh, it doesn't mean that art's not present in the class. So the formal interactions with museums, as I say, have been depressingly 19th century, but the everyday classroom experience really integrates artistic creativity uh, in unusual ways. I'm over here. Yep. <laughs> Wendy Brady Hoff from the University of Wyoming Art Museum. And um, I guess Anya and David, this is pretty much directed to you, but anybody else could jump in. I guess I'm curious to know, um, given the nature of education, K through 12 education, in our countries today, um, where it's very much product-based um, testing, how or what strategies do you use um, with both students and, frankly, faculty um, when you're proposing to use an, a completely alternative method of teaching, um, such as interdisciplinarity, um, with, with students and faculty who are much more product-based um, as opposed to process-based? Well, I'll start. Uh, that's the big challenge. I mean, you've identified the, the biggest problem. And we're, uh, I don't want to be depressing, but we're increasingly moving toward, more towards vocationalism in all aspects of education, whether it's K through 12, but certainly in higher education. And, you know, as a parent, um, you know, I think we can all agree when you're paying $60,000 a year for your kid to go to school, you do hope they get a job at the end. But that's become really a, a just a, a major factor in education right now. Um, I was thinking, maybe not exactly what you're talking about, but I was, I was struck a few minutes ago. I was thinking about a conversation I had with a trustee here at Dartmouth who's the CEO of a company, and he said the biggest problem that he faces in business today is with people under the age of 30 who are fantastically talented, but he said they are so risk averse that he won't put them into senior management positions. He gave, a, a, just recently, a 31-year-old the opportunity to head up a division within his company, and he said it's just a, you know, really a big promotion. And the guy came into his office the next day and said, I, I don't want to do it. And he said, why? And he said, because I'm afraid I'll fail. And he said, the only way you can succeed is by taking a risk. We're not really encouraging that. Um, then a completely unrelated but a secondary thought I was just thinking of a minute ago, which I think is so important for museums. If anybody has done any st uh, study of history, 19th century history in particular, but um, Freud, before he wrote Moses and Monotheism, was in London and went to the museum to look at the, the um, statue of Moses, Michelangelo, and every single day for one year, 
in silence, sat in front of that statue. And it was, some people speculated he maybe had a nervous breakdown, but the, the museum was the pivotal point that really led him to write this wonderful book, Moses and Monotheism. We don't really allow for that kind of space, particularly, and again, it goes back to the notion of everything being chalk block. You know, we just, from the moment kids are born, they are programmed into every minute has to be filled with something meaningful. And again, to go back to, um, as William and I have kind of harped on here, Dewey, you know, imagination is the only thing, and it's inspired by art, imagination comes about through, and creativity, through absence of programming, through silence, through just being able to be, and we really don't have enough of that time. And again, this is, I don't have a solution for it because we're test driven in this country, so K through K-12 education is, people say we can't, we can't even do an art program because we have to teach to the test. I mean, we, you know, and, and salaries are dependent upon it, all sorts of things. So it's, it's a huge conundrum. I wish I had a solution. I'd run for president if I did, but. Unfortunately, you'd lose. Um. <laughs> <laughs> I said, unfortunately. Yeah, this, this risk aversion is a very serious problem that, that has to be overcome. Uh, one of our faculty members just instituted a thing in her class where she requires the students to keep a failure log, and if they don't fail enough times during the week, then they get points deducted. <laughs> Which I really like. I'm going to adopt that myself. Um, what do we do with faculty? It's, faculty are a big problem because, of course, they're all products of this system. And since it produced them, who are big successes, it must be a perfect system. Right. So this is what we have to fight against all the time. Uh, we start with the language. Our faculty all have PhDs, but instead of calling them professors, we call them tutors. We have no ranks. Everyone has the same size office. We have no departments. So we have no department chairs. And everybody recognizes it's a collective activity that we're doing, which is trying to educate these students and ourselves uh, together. What employment, employers want, as you sort of alluded to, is not people who get graduate summa cum laude. They want people who can write and speak effectively and persuasively. They want people who can most importantly collaborate with other members of the organization from outside their little department to solve real problems. They want people who can reason quantitatively and analytically. And these are the things that the classical liberal arts tradition used to do before it was driven by you know, numerical scores and GRE tests and, and fill in the blanks. And so that's what we try very hard to do. We don't give exams uh, at Quest. Most of the work is collaborative rather than individual. We don't emphasize the competitive, but the, the growth that occurs. And we demand failure, basically. We, we don't just don't allow students to say they can't do this, they're, they're afraid of this, or they didn't have the background for this. We say, well, sorry, it's required here, so you don't have an option. And students actually rise to the challenge when they're given it. Unfortunately, they're not given it very often. Yeah, and um, Julia, I know we're over time, but I might just add one more thought around K through 12, since that's the hat that I wear at the museum, and I'm looking at some of my K through 12 colleagues in the audience, and I, I of course, completely agree that um, public education is very much immersed in standardized testing right now. However, one thing that I think schools are working toward are many of these 21st century skills that we've been talking about and kind of love them or hate them. Um, new learning standards like Common Core um, this month, New York City schools, uh, grades three through eight, they're taking the first assessments aligned with Common Core. And while the results are not going to be very encouraging, it's a step towards encouraging skills of critiquing, of valuing independence, of evidence-based reasoning. Um, I know colleagues like Michelle Groey, who's here in the front, um, who can probably recite the seven attributes of being college and career ready, um, can talk more about that. And so I think there are principles out there, um, but I think it's about how museums can be leaders in shaping some of those new ways of thinking. Thank you. Uh, uh, please join me in thanking our panelists once again.
I have just a few housekeeping notes, and uh, if you were here yesterday, uh, this will be familiar to you, but for the benefit of, of everyone. Uh, we'll now continue with our breakout sessions until noon. Please look for your name on your yellow sheets. I see most of you have them out, that's great. Uh, and proceed to the room indicated, either downstairs or here in the ballroom. Session leaders who don't already have their brainstorming sheet, I apologize, just come see me in a moment, and I'll give it to you. The purpose of uh, the breakout session is to brainstorm together and to share some of the ideas that uh, have been generated for you about what an ideal museum learning environment might look like. Please take all of your belongings with you as the uh, ballroom will be uh, changing over the lunchtime. And then at noon, we have bo box lunches available for everyone in the Ford Sayer room. If you had indicated any dietary restrictions, please see the staff member with the clipboard down there. They'll help you find your lunch. And uh, feel free to eat anywhere you like. Uh, we had asked for some ideas uh, at registration uh, for additional topics that you might be interested in talking about. So we've collected those and put them on sheets. They're available in the lunchroom. So if you'd like to pick up one of those and use it as a catalyst for discussion uh, over lunch, please feel free to do that as well. And then finally, please bear in mind that tours will begin at 1.30, and uh, you can identify your tour on the back of your badge. It's Friday, uh, and your tour leaders will be holding a card that matches the color uh, of your tour indicated. Epic of American Civilization tours meet up here, and all of the rest of the tours meet downstairs. Thank you very much. <laughs>